Hello and welcome to Gatecrasher, the podcast that takes you behind the scenes of iconic events. I'm your host, event planner Anna Peters, and this week my guest Alana Buckley joins us to talk about creating pop-up events that seem to appear magically out of nowhere. Then everybody sits down and you just look at 1,300 people sitting in the middle of a car park and all of a sudden it's just so beautiful. Dinner on Blanc is a worldwide phenomenon that's featured in 80 different cities spread over six continents. Founded in Paris 34 years ago, it's now attended by hundreds of thousands of people along the way, earning itself a hashtag that's been used over 173,000 times. It's the ultimate pop-up picnic party. People dressed head to toe in elegant white clothing assemble at an iconic location for an evening extravaganza under the stars bringing with them their own table, chair, crockery, food and even a crisp white tablecloth. And where will the dinner be? They don't know. In fact, they won't even know until mere minutes before the event. Now, some of you might be thinking, what? Meet at an undisclosed location, bring all my stuff for dinner, even my table and dress all in white. Why? Well, sometimes fun is enough of a reason for an event to exist. So it's great to see Dinner on Blanc in all its eccentricities returning to London this summer. To find out more, I'm delighted to be joined by previous host Alana Buckley and now Managing Director of Curb Events, as together we gatecrash the dining sensation that is Dinner on Blanc. It was started in Paris. Just uh, uh, the desire of the man that founded it to just have something different to do with his friends, really, more than anything else. I think they were kind of getting a bit older. They were a bit bored of, I guess, going to bars and and restaurants in the same way. And he just thought, let's do something to sort of shake up our social scenes, really, and to also widen our social network a little bit. I think the other kind of great thing um, in the sort of ethos of, of Dinner on Blanc is the idea that it kind of is about bringing strangers together, sort of people that are connected maybe through social networks, but aren't necessarily sort of good friends. And and obviously, when you dine with people, you tend to dine with your friends, right? You tend to dine with your close, close friends, unless you're maybe at a wedding or something like this. And this was this idea that actually, there's so many people out there that you would probably love and get on with that are friends of friends because you have similar interests, you run in similar circles, you live in the same city. And could we think of something where we could get those people together in a, in a kind of organic way um, and create something that, that, that they could all enjoy together? And from there, it, um, it it sort of started to grow in popularity. I think um, people experienced the event in Paris and sort of started to say, wouldn't this be an amazing thing to do in our own city? Um, so it now runs in 60 cities um, across the world. Every city has a different way of doing the event. And there are rules about how one goes about <laughs> running Dinner en Blanc. I um, thought there might be. Uh, there, there are. Might be. <laughs> <laughs> and they are... Um, relatively pedantic rules uh, to a certain extent. And I can certainly go into that if you're interested. I am quite interested in that. <laughs> but, um, what I'm interested at the beginning is let's just start right at the beginning. So she said it started in Paris. It's spread out around the world. Yeah. Now you hosted it in London. Yes. So how do you become a host? What made you want to become a host and how did you go about that process? It's simple in some ways. I'm 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 American, but um I have quite a few Canadian friends and the um event in Canada is massive. And that that's obviously the the sort of French Canadian connection is what created the sort of first dinner en blancs in Quebec, and then it kind of moved to Montreal and and, and to Toronto. But then it obviously kind of just took Canada by storm. Um, and uh, a very good friend of mine is from is from Vancouver, and she had a living in London though. She had a very good friend um, in Vancouver who ran the Vancouver dinner en blanc, which is one of the biggest in the world. I think they have about six thousand people that come to it every year. And he obviously through his dinner en blanc network received an email saying. We're desperate to do this event in London, but we've never quite been able to nail it. Do you have any friends in London that might be interested? You know, this is the whole network. Does anybody have any friends in London that might be interested? Um, so he um, spoke to my my friend Ainsley, um, who then said, well, who do I know that works 
in events. She she also worked in events. She worked on the 2012 Olympics. So um, totally randomly when we were both, um, we were on holiday, we were in Vegas, <laughs> said one night, can I buy you a drink at the bar? I have a business uh, opportunity to, to share with you. Um, so we sort of started chatting about it. She sent me a bit more detail. And to be honest, I was I was hooked. Um, one of the rules of Dinner en Blanc is that it, it, it has to be hosted by a group of three. Uh, it, you split it into kind of operations, sales, kind of commercial, and then PR and marketing. How many people do you need to run an event like that? Interestingly, Dinner en Blanc is very, very focused on volunteers. That is, again, part of the ethos of the whole thing is the idea is that obviously nobody gets paid. You know, it's um, if you make money on the event, you obviously can keep that money. That's not, you pay, you pay a franchise fee back to the, the head office um, of, of a percentage of every ticket sale, but every ticket sale from then on goes into, you know, goes into the organizer's bank account, really, for lack of a better term. We obviously had to set up a limited company um, because of the amount of money that would be kind of going in and going out. Um, but, you know, the, the idea is that everybody that then helps underneath, and to be honest, it's a especially if you get a big turnout and we we managed a big turnout, it has to be a bit of a military uh, operation, really. And and so y- you have to recruit c- quite a, a group of people that are quite interested in in getting involved kind of in a, in a slightly more meaningful way. Um, there's uh, throughout the process, I think we started planning in uh, about May and our, our, our event was on the 3rd of September. So, um, it, you know, there was a, it was a, a fair few months of kind of um, drumming up support. And, and it was really interesting how those people kind of came about. The Dinner on Blanc International obviously had a, a mailing list and, and you, you get to use all of that. And what happened was, you know, there were actually a lot of people in London who were subscribers to the to the Dinner en Blanc mailing list and everything like that. A lot of them were French, <laughs> interestingly, um, that had moved to London. And, and Dinner en Blanc is such a cultural phenomenon in, in France that, you know, they they understood what it was. So actually, a lot of our volunteers were were French um, anyway, um, a lot of them from Paris, which was interesting. And then really, we dug into our networks as well and, and you know, thought about friends that we thought would would be interested, would think it was a great idea. Um, and then you create a, a group of what they call table hosts. Um, and those table hosts do quite a bit of, of work for you pre-event. Um, they help sell tickets. They help um, they help just push comms. They they you know do all of that. And then on the day, they um, have a very very important role. Um, I think we had, gosh, probably twenty table hosts. We were very lucky in that. From my background, from a catering perspective, we had partners that we could um, that we could ask for for support from production companies, entertainment, things like that. So um, there was certainly a big team uh, involved. But I think mm. the, the key people really are those volunteer table hosts. You could not put the event on without them, and they are very much volunteers. Alana, you have mentioned this idea about, you know, we've talked about there's thousands of people waiting. Mm. There's this huge waiting list and you were helped partly because of the interest that was already there by Mm. the French people and so on. That whole thing of trying to make an event really desirable and maybe the fear of missing out, that's a big thing, Mm. isn't it, with Dinner en Blanc, that people see this incredible image and they want a part of it. Was that kind of part of the whole marketing strategy to build something on word of mouth, but also make it desirable and think people are going to really feel this is a must attend event. Yeah, absolutely. And actually the way that the invitation mechanism is built into the event sort of does that for you, which is really interesting. So um, the the way that it, and again, this is again, something that's that's governed from central is that they have a phasing system. So Basically, the only people that can be invited to purchase tickets in the first phase are people that have been to a Dinner en Blanc event before. And obviously, that's quite a small group. And then the the phase is then open um, and you're allowed to set the phases in terms of, you know, you get to say, okay, after we've sold 150 tickets, we want to open phase two. Or if you're having trouble selling your first chance of tickets, you can open phase two. But all of the comms around the invitation is all based on this idea of don't call us, we'll call you, sort of. Um, you need to be in the know. And then you are allowed then, each person who's involved in the event is allowed to then invite five people with a code for the second phase. And at the, and, and that's where it kind of creates that, yeah, that that kind of 
money can't buy, kind of intrigue. And the other thing I think that, that you know, is really unique about this event and, and creates that air of sort of mystery and exclusivity is that um, it, nobody knows where it is. It's a completely secret location. And other than the idea that people wear white, it actually you don't get a huge amount of information or detail when you're when you're being invited. And so I think there is this kind of it's kind of cloaked in 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 a bit of mystery, which I think, you know, there's obviously a huge amount of events in in London. Um but I think because of that kind of mystery element of it, 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 it just stands apart from a lot of the other events that that happen. And because it is all based on this idea of people you know and networks. Um, but 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 I would say, and when when I sort of say that back and I hear myself saying it, it sounds like a bit gross, a bit like exclusive in a, in a particular way. But I think what's really interesting about Dinner en Blanc is that because it's a global event, the people that are in that people who are in the no kind of group are not, for lack of a better term, they're not posh white British people. They're really not. They're they're completely international. They're from all over the world. Tickets are actually really cheap considering they're about 25 quid. So it's a way of being exclusive without barring people from, from entry. It's not inaccessible. And I think that's Again, something that that they've done an incredibly good job of is that the people that come to the event are actually really diverse. It's men, it's women, it's people from all you know walks of life. It's actually a much more diverse crowd, which I think is just incredible that you can kind of walk that fine line between kind of accessibility and exclusivity and do it in a way that makes it a really kind of sexy, fun event to promote and for people to come to, but doesn't actually mean that when everybody gets there, they all look the exact same, which is, I think, just a real, uh, yeah, just just a real success of, of that event and doing it in London. You know, I'm sure that's not true everywhere that this event takes place. But in London, we managed to tap into just that real global kind of um, the, the, the kind of the, the great kind of melting pot of London. And, and that was what was really exciting about it as well. Yeah, I, it is interesting, isn't it? There's a really um, fine tipping point where fear of missing out can become just being pissed off yeah. that you're not invited. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and getting that balance is quite tricky. And then also having an event that you really feel that you want to go to, but isn't cliquey and isn't elite. And it has had some criticism, <laughs> hasn't it, over the years. <laughs> uh, fascinatingly, there's a new event, which I think is called Cessoir Noir. Cessoir Noir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the sort of antithesis. And of, it's yeah. free yeah, everybody wears all black yep. instead of all white. So people do, I suppose, feel whether it's enough for an event just to kind of um, be exclusive, whether it has to have more relevance and more mm. meaning, perhaps in this day and age. Absolutely. And I, and I think that is it's meant to be a lovely evening for people to enjoy mm. each other. It is not ever. It's been not, your experience. Of yeah, it. yeah, it's not ever been meant to be anything, I think, more groundbreaking than that. And interestingly, we probably as a group, tried to push the boundaries a little bit more with our venue and with some of the stuff that we wanted to overlay. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you about yeah, the location. Yeah, Because from its heritage, I suppose it was it's almost a, at its heart, it started possibly, you could almost describe it as a picnic, you know, and often it was held in beautiful parks and so on. But when you hosted it, you took a very different approach, holding it at an urban destination. Yeah, I mean, it's, it was basically a building site. Let's not. Yeah. <laughs> let's. It's beautiful so, now. It was a building site. It, there were a lot of cranes in the background. Yeah. Um, so this is what's now known as Cubit Square, isn't Cubit it? Square, Cubit yeah. Cross. Lewis, Lewis yeah. Cubit Square, which is the sort of northern. Um, so if you're in Granary Square, you kind of go around to the back. And and that this was the before Cold Drops Yard was there. This was before a lot of those redevelopments were. And it was, um, yeah, it was urban. The, the one thing I would say is that the reason that this event has not done tremendously well in London, and actually we didn't run it in our second year and 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 um it, it's been a tricky one is because the bureaucracy around public space and and private space with outdoor space in London is um really different to the way it is in a lot of other cities. I mean in Paris the event is literally held in a public park and I have been told and I don't know if this is r- true but it's good it's a good narrative for me I guess um is that they don't get licenses They just literally rock up and it's because the event is so well established and people understand what it is. They just get to do their thing. And 
I've spoken, and I'm from New York, and I've spoken to the or- organizers in New York a few times. And, and even in New York, which I would have expected would have been a really tricky city to hold something like this. And they are like, nope, they're super supportive. The government's super supportive. They love the event. That's a great photo opportunity. Oh, gosh, no, we are totally supported. And basically anywhere we want to do the event, we're able to do it. And our experience in London was completely different. Um, we really struggled in our first year um, finding a location. I mean, the other thing I would say is once you realize that you're going to have to hire a venue, you're on the hook for £10,000 before you've done a thing, um, which again, makes it really, when you're trying to do the event for the first time, you don't have any capital, makes it a very, very tricky thing. So, you know, we had our sites set on, and, and you know, my my background is, is, is unique venues. That's, you know, where I started my career. So I, you know, I had a list as long as my arm of places that we could do it. Capacity is, is an issue. You want the event to have at least a thousand people at it. That's that's the kind of that the more people you have, the more special it is. So you want it to be a capacity, you know, a big capacity venue. There just aren't that many venues in London that have a capacity, an outdoor capacity of over a thousand people are happy for you to drink, dance, have live music. And the only venues that really we could find were venues that we would have had to have hired. And the other thing is that it has to be a central location um, because of the logistics of getting people there. It has to be reachable Mm. by tube. So how do you organize that? You've got hundreds of people coming to the right destination. They have to get there on time, but they don't know where the destination is. So this is presumably where your volunteers get involved. Correct. (laughs) Correct. So you, uh, depending on where your venue is and how many people you're going to have, you sort of decide upon destination points. We basically drew a line around King's Cross and went, okay, where are there kind of six, I think we had six tube stations that meant that nobody had to change, you know, um, and King's Cross was brilliant for that because we were, we, we actually had a lot of, you know, space to play with, but we wanted them to be all over London. So people didn't, again, then have to like, with all their stuff, schlep to somewhere really far away to then get to King's Cross. So I think it was, we, we, you know, we were at Green Park, London Bridge. We actually had a group that met at King's Cross because that seemed obvious to us. Um, A few other places. Um, And actually, once you get all of the RSVPs and you know who your guests are going to be, you ask actually every guest to fill out a form saying which station they would like to, to, to start their journey at. So depending on how that ends up falling was how many volunteers we then had for each of those venues. And I actually remember Green Park very specifically because so many people were coming from work, obviously. I really remember Green Park being like, I think literally half the people coming had all signed up for Green Park. So we had, it was madness at Green Park and we had about six or seven volunteers there. But literally the volunteers are there. We tell them exactly where to meet. I think we did pin locations and everything like that. And they turn up and there's a person that says with a little sign that says, you know, dinner en blanc and everybody meets. And some of the best images that we have from the night are of people on the tube. They're brilliant. Just people coming up the escalator all in their white outfits. And then people on the other side, just commuters going, what the hell is going on? Those are actually some of, honestly, some of my favorite images. Yeah. And then and people love that, don't they? That whole kind of flash mob feeling. Yeah, that you're part <laughs> it is of a something. flash mob yeah. thing. And then everybody then gets off the tube at King's Cross and people still have absolutely no idea where they're going. And then they marched up to Cubit Square and where they found a beautiful sort of uh, empty square with um, festoon lighting and white bunting. And the, the, the other brilliant part about it is it just traditionally people bring their own tables and chairs. Mm, I wanted to ask you that because it, it is a sort of almost the ultimate blank canvas, isn't it? First of all, you're told what to wear. You're told to bring your food, yep. your <laughs> furniture, a chair. It's an awful lot uh-huh. to lug across London, isn't it? So for yours, did they bring the furniture or did what did you have in place? We got a bit of a special dispensation from Dinner en Blanc, Inc. to, to actually rent tables and chairs on the night. So we felt uh, that in year one, especially, we just had to have the provision for, to provide people with as much as we possibly could on site. So we um, uh, rented uh, tables and chairs. Again, that was something that you could add on when you're when you bought your ticket. That was 100% the right 
decision. Um, I think only about 10% of people brought their own furniture, which you completely understand. So when you arrived, there was almost like a cloakroom <laughs> where you got your tables and chairs. You handed in a little token and you got your tables and chairs. And then you, but then you set up, you know, you literally go to your section and there were six sections based on the tube stations. So if you're in Green Park, you go to the space. We had balloons that kind of massive balloons in the air that that said the names of the the different um, the different areas. And so you're okay. I'm Green Park. So this is where you can put some of your own creativity on it. You know, we talked at the beginning about yes. some of it being prescriptive, but you do have a chance to do to put some <laughs> of your own touches onto it. Again, people who know about it as well bring their own tablecloths, they bring their own china, they bring their own candelabra, they bring they really really go for it. But again, we didn't want to make that a requirement either. So we did sell picnic baskets as well. So we we you, we did a kind of a catering package where you could get like a meat and cheese board or you could get kind of we think we did like a like a charcuterie and cheese one and we did a better like a best of British with um, scotch eggs and, and, and sausage rolls and things like that. And then we did sell all of our own wine. That's a decision that they let the organizers make. The event is very strict about alcohol. Um, you can't have anything except wine and sparkling wine. They they are very strict about spirits. Again, for understandable reasons, kind of the idea is that it's a dinner party, right? The idea is not that it's like a massive piss up. No, there's so, an element of you, sophistication about it. Yes. Exactly. And it's one of the ways, to be perfectly honest, that you can actually make some money on the event is, is, is by doing the alcohol yourself. A lot of cities don't. A lot of cities say, we want people to feel like they can bring everything. And again, that there isn't in inclusivity around being able to bring everything yourself. I think had we done the event twice, we probably would have thought about a way around that. I'm not sure. Um, but but we didn't. We 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 had a wine sponsor and we we sold all of the wine um and then it was collected on the night. So yeah, from a logistical perspective, that first half an hour of the event was possibly the most stressful time in my entire professional career. Cause you've got 12, we had, we, we had 1300 people in total, um, which was incredible. We never thought, we never thought we would sell that many tickets, but we had 1300 people descending upon this square, not really knowing what was going on, not a hundred percent sure. You know, you also have to rely on everybody to kind of work together to set their tables up. Obviously nothing ever goes to plan. So there were, we were short on picnic baskets, but then everybody sits down and you just look at 1300 people sitting in the middle of a car park, basically, for lack of a better term. Um, and all of a sudden, it's just so beautiful. And it's just incredible. And then and then one thing that um, that is is em- emblematic of Dinner en Blanc is something called the sparkler moment. So as soon as everybody sat down, you light a sparkler. So once you've got everybody lined up, the rows are all neat. Everybody's there. The tables are dressed. That's your role to choreograph this magical moment to signify the event's <laughs> about to start. <laughs> This magical moment, and I will tell you a funny story. Two days before the event, we'd obviously submitted all of our RAMs and all of our health and safety information to King's Cross, to Argent, who were were the the kind of land, the landlords there. And um, we said it a million times in site visits about the sparkler moment, the sparkler moment. And then we got a call from the the guy who was our our partner saying, um, yeah, they're not going to let you guys light anything on fire. (laughs) And we were like, okay, it's literally the most important part of the entire event that we do this. We've spoken about it so many times. He's like, yeah, it's just not going to, it's not going to, our health and safety manager has just said no. So we eventually, I think, spoke to the health and safety manager and we managed to like convince him, but we ended up panicking and having to buy like a million buckets of sand at the last minute. I mean, my Amazon account at that point was not great. Um, So that we could then immediately put all of the sparklers out in the sand. And then we promised that we would collect them all and we would put them in a, it was, yeah, it was one of those, I mean, talk about just things going wrong at the very last minute. Um. (laughs) I was wondering what plan Bs you needed to have in place. And that wasn't what I was picturing. I was thinking about things like obviously outdoor event, wet weather contingency. None. None. Bring a jumper. Bring a bring a bring a Mac again. They that the, they're very strict about it. In fact, I, and, and it was really interesting because I think London is just a little bit stricter of a place than other cities because we struggled with stuff like they didn't want us to use balloons. They weren't going to let us do the sparkler moment. Our sort of um, main contacts in Canada were like, I don't understand. You've you 
hired a venue, right? You're their client. And we were like, yeah, just this is just different. It's different than it is other places. It's 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 just a much stricter place for doing this kind of stuff. And so they couldn't really understand. And then we were trying to kind of explain it to, you know, the people who we were renting stuff from. And 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 there were definitely kind of um definitely clashes in 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 that in terms of I don't think they necessarily thought we were being truthful about how hard the process was from our end, um, which caused quite a lot of friction with the kind of home team. And I think we were trying to do something so different from the sort of normal London events market that it was really hard on the other side as well. So I think that was probably, if I had to sum up the kind of the, the most stressful part of that event was not actually, how do I get 1200 people chairs on the night? I've been doing events a long time. It was that managing of all of those expectations and trying to kind of explain to all the different parties absolutely what the plan was and how, yeah. you know, how it was going to, and that, and not really ha- having that kind of understanding from the sort of our, our sort of stakeholders in, in Canada um, was really, really tricky because you need their support you need their buy-in to make it successful because they kind of hold the key to a lot of it in terms of the guest lists and the website and all of that stuff. So if, if they don't play ball with you, 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 you'd be really, you know, you'd be really struggling. Did you not at some point think this is just a completely crazy idea? I don't know if I can pull it all off. There were a bunch of times when we went, we're going to lose our shirts. We're going to, we're going to lose a significant amount of money. Um, at one point, Canada said, push it back. You're not ready you're not ready, push it back three weeks. And we were like, we can't, we can't get the venue in three, you know, there were, there there was a lot of, a lot of, yeah, a lot of emotional calls right before the events, spending 24 hours, you know, tying little ribbons to to things and, you know, doing all of that kind of, because again, you just had, there was just us. So all of those little filling bat, little pots with sand and, you know, doing all of this stuff was, was just left to the three of us really. So yeah. Oh, there were times that it tested every bit of of nerve that I had. Given all that, given, you know, the, all the challenges, it was an event that nobody had done anything like before, your small team, the location and so on. How did you measure the success at the end of it? How did you have a feeling of what for you made you feel that you'd pulled off this incredibly difficult but successful event? You know, in a, in a purely mercenary way, we broke even, <laughs> which, you know, There was a point at which I was not sure. I think we even had enough money in our bank account left over that we went to Deschumes for dinner. I really remember this. We had about 85 quid left and we went, (laughs) the three of us went to Deschumes and that was, that was the rest of the money gone. We had a, we had a celebratory dinner, but it was not anywhere particularly fancy, but it was that moment of going, how did the heck did we get 1300 people here? Most of them are strangers. It was beautiful. It was fun. I think that was the other thing that really for me was a big measure because we wanted to take it in a different direction. For us, London is not a stuffy city. London is not an antiquated place. London is a is at the forefront of everything that's exciting from food to drink to music to architecture to parts of the city. And I specifically really fought to make the event feel like London. And that was down to the style of the event. We went for quite a modern style compared to a lot of the other cities um, in terms of how we dress the space, in terms of our entertainment, obviously in terms of the, the venue itself. They were not happy with us in Canada when we said, this is the final, like, this is, this is all we've got. So this is where we're going. And they obviously wanted it to be at the Tower of London or Buckingham Palace or something, you know. And we were like, we're going to this, like, pretty much, like, half-built plaza in a part of London that you probably never heard of. But for us, that was a lot of how it was meant to be. We were very, we were very kind of, um, yeah, we, we kind of wanted to do hipster dinner on Blanc a little bit and, and it, and we really pulled it off. And I think for me, that was what I loved is like seeing it on the night. I went, I had a vision of this being different than it has been other places. And I think we really managed to pull that off. And I think and I think the other thing is that the event is fun, obviously, other places, but our event was really fun. I think people didn't expect it to be that fun. Our friends didn't expect it to be that fun. They all came because they were like, we've had to listen to these three idiots talk about this for five months. We might as well come and see what this is all about. But afterwards, I had friends come up and say, that was literally one of the best nights of my life. That was one of the most, fu- that was the most fun. I just completely 
dave in to how ridiculous this whole thing is and you have to that's the magic of it that's the reason that you wear the clothes and you do the thing is because you kind of go you probably spend the whole day before you go rolling your eyes going i can't believe i'm lugging a picnic basket to the office that has sort of a candelabra in it this is ridiculous but once you get there you just let yourself go and i think we use the word experiential so much in the events industry don't we and i and i'm not sure we ever nail experiential that much and people are a bit jaded, I think, a little bit. They've seen a lot of stuff. And Dinner en Blanc is so different. And I think people get there and they just go, I'm just going to go for this. And and that's the real, it's really irreverent. It's really, um, and I think people loved that. They were dancing under the stars, you know, in the middle of this outdoor space. Um, and and that that to me was just watching the people enjoy it was, was, was how I knew it had been a massive success. You're listening to Gatecrasher as we go behind the scenes of Dinner on Blanc with Alana Buckley. Later on, I ask Alana what events she'd most like to Gatecrush, and I'd love to know the same about you, so please let me know by joining in on the conversation over on Twitter or Instagram, where you'll find us at Evolve Events. Since Alana hosted Dinner on Blanc at King's Cross, the area has undergone a huge change, helped in part by Curb Food, the street food company Alana now works for, who were invited to work with developers to help rejuvenate the area. I asked Alana to explain how Curb have changed the UK food scene and how they're now bringing their street food concept to the world of events and revolutionising the way guests eat. The company was founded by um, a, a, an absolutely amazing woman called Petra Barron, who was actually a, a street food trader herself. She ran a chocolate van called the Chalk Star, and she was on the kind of circuit with all the rest of the street food traders, which at that time was basically festivals, Brick Lane, and Camden. The, the scene was still kind of in its in its infancy. But what they found when they were all chatting to each other is that they they were all experiencing the same issues, right? VAT and health and safety and getting burnt um, when festivals would go into administration and keep their money and, and you know, all this stuff that small businesses all kind of um, struggle with. But also in the being a one man band food business is, is one of the hardest places to be, I think, uh, uh, to be a, a small business owner, to be a sort of single um, owner operator. And Petra sort of said to some of the other people kind of in, in this kind of crew, um, we should really organize. We should become a become an organization. You know, we could share best practice. We can lobby. We can band together. We can kind of um, do collective bargaining. Wouldn't that be great? And everybody went, yeah, that's a great idea. I'm too busy. I think you should do it. And she was like, okay, well, I did come up with the idea. So I guess it's probably on me. Um, and so she she created Curb. And, you know, it's a platform. It's something that it, it's accessible to everybody, but it's also something you use to kind of raise yourself up, level yourself up. And also to kind of legitimize it, you know, to kind of dispel some of the myths around it being dirty or the people being, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I think people maybe thought about street food at the time. Where it started to kind of gain momentum was that landowners, landlords, um, developers started to think this is a really great way to attract people to a place that they may not have gone before. So the idea of kind of food as placemaking really, I think, came into being with street food. And I think that's because obviously we're mobile. Um, At that point, it was such a It was just such an exciting thing. People did not have access to street food in the way that they do now. So people would actively come to see who, what traders were there and to kind of do that whole experience. I mean, it's crazy to think at that point, um, some of the traders that were trading with us were people like Bao and Pizza Pilgrims that have gone on to have these incredible careers. And London really wouldn't be the same without some of those brands now. But back in, back 10 years ago, they were trading on the street like a lot Mm. of the other, the other companies. You've also taken it into venues, haven't you? Now, this is your area, I think, Alana, Curb Events. What's the experience of taking the food into specific events? How does that work? I wanted to create an event catering company that would rival any of the other event catering companies in London, but obviously would be using this product, which was our food traders, that nobody else was using. And and that's what I did. And, And I sort of looked at it and I said, you know what, right now we are providing a service. We are putting two or three street food vans in somebody's house for their wedding or their 40th birthday party. And occasionally we're working with corporates, but it's all very slapdash. It's not being done in any kind of, um, in any kind of really thought through way. And we're also not providing any support services. 
we're not doing our own bars. We're not providing coffee. We're not doing front of house staff. We're not doing cloakrooms. We can't compete with the big dogs in the industry if we can't do all of those support services. So that was sort of where we started. We went, okay, how do we do these support services? Also, how do we teach our traders to do it? That that was a big education piece for me at the beginning was I, I always say that my first year at Curb was basically doing educational outreach. I spent a huge amount of time talking to venues about why I thought street food could work in their venues and how it could be safe and how we could do it indoors and how we could do everything. And I spent a huge amount of time training our traders to be able to deliver the stuff that I had promised to, to all these venues. And I think that that for me was kind of how it how it sort of naturally um, evolved. And coming from the background I came from, I knew that venues was the right place to go. But I obviously knew that we were going to have to prove to the venues that we could do something very slick, very corporate, very professional. Um, and, and that was sort of the direction I decided to take it in. And it, it completely paid off. So it was partly persuading the venues, also helping the traders have the tools to know what they needed to do. But you're not mentioning the clients, the end users. And presumably that's because you already knew that there was a market for people looking for choice. Do you know, it's such a good point. I, I always tell that story and I always talk about the traders and the venues and I never talk about the clients. Um, I think that's because I, I was confident that the clients were there, as you as you said. You know, I think a big part of it was not trying to run before we could walk. We weren't going after Barclays and Linklaters and things at the beginning of the journey. We were trying to sort of um, target the types of companies that we knew street food would resonate with. So I think I knew that we had just, we had come into the market at this point where it was so exciting. And and it was also something that other caterers were trying to do. And honestly, we're doing terribly. Even in my event catering days, you'd get those briefs and go down to the chefs and say, oh, it's street food. And they would all roll their eyes and go, I don't want to do any more bloody burritos. And obviously, everybody knew it was a thing. And it was just kind of becoming something that was kind of being more sort of um, accepted in, in more mainstream audiences. Um, and I just knew that we could do it better. We've talked about Dinner on Blanc, this incredible event that you hosted yourself, but also through Curb, you've worked at and work at extraordinary venues, putting on incredible events. But if there was one event that you could gatecrash yourself somewhere in the world, could be now or in the past, what would that be? I think I'd love to be, not to, to, to quote Hamilton, I think I'd love to be in the room where it happened. I, I think I'd love to, to gatecrash something like Davos or something where people in positions of power were making those really crucial decisions for everybody. I think not only would something like that just be a spectacle, I'm sure, from an events perspective, from a catering perspective, from a hospitality perspective. I think, um, like we were saying earlier, you know, in the world that we now that we live in now, it's bigger than this. It's bigger than just what we do. There's so much happening in the world. There's so much uns- uncertainty. And and if I was going to gatecrash something, I'd want it to be something where I could really see what's the levers of power being exercised um, at the same time as being able to kind of experience really amazing hospitality. So I think it would be something like that, you know, like a G8 summit or, or Davos or something where there's really important work being done at the same time that I'm sure people are experiencing really exceptional hospitality. And I think you see, we see this more and more and more, aren't we? People want their events to be meaningful. It's what we were sort of touching on with um, Dinner on Blanc, wasn't it? Yeah, people want meaning and they want to look at what impact their event has. So being at an event like Davos, you know, you're absolutely in the heart of trying to look at what kind of impact the event has. So I think you better be working on your pitch list then at the last well, yeah. next year, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure street food has quite made it made it that far yet, but we'll we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure it'll be just a matter of time, matter of time with your drive and all the wonderful people you've got as part of the team. Thank you, Alana, for your time, for sharing such fascinating insights with us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate it. So many great insights shared by Alana. I loved her honesty about how difficult and stressful it can be hosting an event. We've all been there, dealing with last-minute panics, and Alana is an inspiration in holding a nerve, even when things start to unravel. She proves that with a bit of clear-headed, creative thinking, there's a solution to be found. Though a well-written event plan that all stakeholders have seen, agreed to, and signed off well in advance of the event has to be every event planner's best friend. Go bold with your venue choice. Like Alana, we love to host events in unusual spaces, yes, including car parks. 
if it's the right vibe for your audience then you just need to find a way to make the logistics work the pleasure that Alana experienced when she pulled off this complicated and challenging event is why most of us work in events. There really is nothing like seeing a vision come to life as guests give in to that moment of joy. It's a wonderful thing to put a room full of strangers together and watch them become friends. And it's that craving for connection that make events matter. Orchestrating an event to help people come together is key to facilitating that connection. For Dinner on Blanc, it's a dress code and synchronise elements such as the sparklers moment. These magical moments are the ones that are going to be most enjoyed, discussed, remembered and shared on social media. Food is a great way to connect people and it was fascinating to hear how London's food scene is shifting. Street food brings an informality to events that help break down barriers. Offering choice and variety recognises that guests want to be treated as individuals, whilst bringing the catering together under a theme helps tell the story of the whole event. And finally, my other big insight from today's conversation was about the power of FOMO. These days, as many of us spend part of the week working from home, an event has to be pretty special to compel people to attend. Dinner en Blanc does this by creating something that's exclusive but still inclusive with powerful comms and marketing that create a pre-event build-up of excitement. Don't forget that the anticipation of an event plays a vital role in the enjoyment of the overall experience, so drip-feeding teasers is a great way to engage guests and ensure that they are just as buzzed to be there as Alana's Dinner en Blanc guests. I'll be back next week with more behind-the-scenes stories of events to help you plan your event, however big or small. So make sure you don't miss out by clicking on the subscribe button on whatever podcast platform you listen on. And I know everybody asks, but it really does make a difference in helping the podcast be found by others. So if you like the show, please leave a review and spread the word. Thanks for listening. See you next time.